to questions later on. We'll be recording the session so that we can share it with colleagues who are unable to attend. As before, um, and after a sort of brief series of introductions, I'll be handing over to our three panelists today who are going to be talking subjects that you've seen advertised. Um, so, I love you, but after 20 weeks, I'm pretty much fed up with actually looking at the daily news broadcast, so I'm now starting to avoid them. But I have found an interesting website that you might want to look up. It's called Positive News. Um, if you go to www.positive.news, you'll find all manner of articles um, that take a slightly more positive view on the world that we live in at the moment, particularly around, obviously, the pandemic and the recession. Um, they're very focused on things like um, how companies are now more focused than ever on diversity, on flexible working patterns and purpose, uh, which I think all of us would agree uh, is good news. Um, and how people are moving away from fossil fuels. And I was just talking to Andrew there about um, either running or uh, cycling to the office. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of positive things that are coming out of, of the pandemic. And some of the things I think could be changes that um, uh, shift um, the way in which we live and the way in which we, we converse and work with each other. So I think there's, you know, there's lots of positive data to look at as well as obviously the, uh, the more negative data from zombie companies to the possibility of a second wave, which we've written on today. Um, personally, I'd like to suggest that actually if we do stay positive and work together and collaborate on projects, work hard for our clients, not only will we survive, but in many cases we'll thrive. And I point to the fact that actually um, Pimento uh, has won uh, more new business in the last four months than we did in the previous two years. Um, the number of inquiries um, from a very diverse range of clients has increased by 124% over the last six weeks. Um, and what I believe is happening here is that clients are beginning to wake up to the benefits of working with independent agencies and consultants and shying away um, from the old group structures. So at last it appears that we're actually getting our message home, which is good news. It's also interesting that our membership um, numbers are up year on year. Um, and, and the positive responses that we're getting and the emails we get from all of you about our events and the surveys and so on um, have been both encouraging and, and really helpful because it allows us to focus on those things that you want us to do more of. So my message this morning is really about staying happy, um, being positive, uh, looking forward to the challenges that we face um, and turning those obviously into opportunities. Um, and you know, whilst you may be sitting there thinking about the fact that you've got furloughed staff and in some cases are having to make people redundant, um, I think that actually if, if we take a positive view on the world around us and if we do reach out to people in the network, partner directors, fellow members, you know, go on the front foot, start actually communicating more and, and uh, getting back out to your social accounts and, and putting out positive messages and, and making sure people are aware that you're open for business, then actually, who knows, it might actually turn to uh, a positive opportunity for you and uh, there's no point, I guess, mulling over the situation. So stay positive and uh, I'm sure keep smiling. That's my message this morning. Sounds like a church message, doesn't it really? But the other three things I was gonna mention is, um, uh, we put out some information last 24, 36 hours and we've invited everyone um, to get engaged around a couple of things. Um, Michelle Morgan, I hope many of you know, uh, is uh, one, of, one of our many uh, mental health um, experts and she's put together a special program for Pimento and the MAG and the PRCA and, and all of our guests. Um, if it's of interest to you, she's giving a stupidly silly price and it's like 40% off. Um, it's, a, it's a gift as it were from us to you. Um, so if you're interested in that, the idea is to run a series of uh, interventions and activities, some of which will be pre-recorded, some of which will be live starting in September, running through to the Christmas period over a 10 week period. And the way she's designed it cleverly is that you can dip in and dip out. Um, and equally to the sort of thing you can do as an agency owner for your team, then there are more substantial discounts to be held depending upon the number of people um, you employ. So if you haven't seen that email, um, Grazer will send a link as we speak on the um, chat line so you can actually link through to that email. It also find details of it on our weekly blog and newsletters. Um, so uh, if it's something you're interested in or something that's one of your team, uh, God forbid, maybe you're having to basically downsize your organization. It, it could be something that you want to gift as part of, a, a, of some sort of exit package. Who knows? So I commend that one to you. And the other thing is um, we've been doing a survey around 
uh, office, returning to the office. I was just talked to Max a minute ago about when they'll be returning at lab and he said it's gonna be not before the new year. Um, we've been doing a survey again with the PRCA and with the MAAG that's now uh, got 50 responses so far, but if you have space and you are looking to sublet or if you are looking to get out of your current space, um, then could you let uh, myself or Tracer know or complete the, the survey? Again, we'll issue the survey details after today's call. Um, what we wanted to do is try and match people with space with people looking for space um, and try and find a way in which we can help to cut your costs. Okay, enough of me. Um, so, yeah, three colleagues with us today. Um, Andrew Nuji, uh, been members of Imagineer for some period of time. I don't know how many years now. I think, Claire, it must be nearly eight or nine years. Um, Andrew was the founder and is the founder of, and CEO of Imagineer. And uh, today's going to be talking about how, actually, how he's managing his business, a business that grew by 43% up to the end of Q1, like a lot of us um, then dived and went into reverse and lost 75% uh, of his business in Q2. Um, they're really very much at the epicenter of one of the industries that's been perhaps one of the hardest hit, which is visitor attractions. They provide digital experiences and content. And clearly, obviously, most of the visitor attractions were stopped and closed from mid-March onwards, um, which obviously impacted on their revenue and income. Um, and today he's going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities and some of the things that he has done as a business leader, uh, lessons he's learned, things he got right, things he got right, wrong, and what he probably will be doing as he moves forward. So welcome Andrew with us today. Um, he'll be joined by Annabelle Dunstan, who many of you know, who's been on lots of our calls, probably most of them. Uh, she's the CEO and founder of QR. and r um, They're going to give us an update on the latest pulse check that they've been running amongst the thousand C-suite leaders over the period. Um, some of the insights there, um, some of the things that you know, the C-suite are concerned about, which based on the conversation we had two weeks ago about how do you target the suite C-suite, how do you get them engaged as an agency owner, there will certainly be some, some findings there and some top tips that she'll share with us all. For those that know q and R, a Brighton-based but national company um, that um, uh, has a product called Pulse Check. Um, they help organizations listen to their employees, clients, and stakeholders and measure stuff and provide consultancy on how to gain and retain people and clients. Uh, their clients include both agencies, uh, membership organizations, and, and corporations themselves. Um, and they've been a, you know, a really good example of how a business has, has uh, you know, evolved um, to cope with the COVID pandemic and what they've done to support both their clients and more widely, how they've given a lot of free support to Pimento members and others um, with offerings of free mental health and also giving them access to the Pulse Check. So I'm really pleased that Annabelle can join us here today. Uh, she's the one with the tan. Uh, Max, um, sitting there in, in South London, um, is a terribly clever chap, actually. I was just reading his CV again this morning, thinking, where did it all go wrong for me? But he works in the intersection between cognitive science and consumer behaviour at Lab. Mento member. He has a master's in cognitive uh, neuroscience and a degree in psychology. Um, and he applies his behavioral thinking to solve commercial problems in digital environments. Uh, he's helped Lab win a large government innovation grant. Uh, he's focusing on the interventions for vulnerable people in financial service journeys. Um, and he also has worked very much on developing company IP for Lab and he provides research-based insights for larger clients. He's also a member of the British Association of Cognitive Neuroscientists. We had a neuroscientist a few weeks ago, didn't we, on our, our call, Dr. Rebecca, um, Dr. Rachel, rather. Lab is an award-winning group of agencies. For those who don't know Lab, the Pimento members have been with us uh, coming up for two years now, and they have a full suite of digital marketing services, uh, which cover, obviously, consumer neuroscience, psychology, and behavioral economics. Um, but they build stuff um, by understanding the consumer psyche, um, which makes the products that they create far more flexible and far more responsive. So there they are this today. We've got a, um, a good number of people. I think we've now got 28 people on the call. I'm going to start by handing over to Andrew and uh, sharing my screen with him. As I say, if you have any questions as we go through, please don't feel, um, um, don't hold back. Please um, pop them into the chat box and we'll find time at the end. Enough for me. Okay, can you see that? We can. Fantastic. Well, um, 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pimento, and thank you, Stephen, for letting us strut our virtual stuff. Um, just to pick up on one of the things you mentioned in your introduction, we have also, interestingly, in the first seven months this year, won almost, I think we won 90% of the amount of new business that we did for the whole of 2019. So there are positives. I'm very much looking forward to what Annabelle, you're going to say about C-suite executives and their mood and, and what Max, you can tell us about the nation more generally as a whole. Um, you will all have your war stories. So this is ours. Let me see if I can move on. So um, broadly, the agenda, what do we do at Imagineer? Um, how do we do it? Who do we do it for? How large? I was going to say, are we? But were we in March 2020? What happened? I think we know what happened. Um, how did we go about trying not to die? Um, have we learned anything? What are we learning and what keeps us awake at night? So that's what I'm going to talk about. The way I'm going to do that is with the help of this. Um, let's see. So how do I do that? Help of this, which is uh, starting at the top right. We're going to talk about three big priorities, which are cash, people and clients. And then um, our pivot strategy. Uh, which amounted to digital everything and uh, healthcare, and then we'll come back to some back burner issues at the end. Hmm. Okay, so what we do. Um, we fundamentally build outstanding multimedia experiences for visitor attractions. They tend to be football clubs, or sporting stadia, museums, exhibitions, galleries, that sort of thing. Um, Although we're agnostic, we build hardware. That's an example of one of our devices on the right-hand side, which we design in Amsterdam and we build in Shenzhen. And above it is a pair of head, uh, headphones. We also build earplugs and earbuds uh, for people who prefer that. Um, uh, we also, of course, build software. Uh, we build our own apps in the software, that, which, is, which is called Tour Builder. Um, we, uh, we have uh, a, a a uh, platform called Tour Builder Plus, which we've designed and built, which allows you to build your own tours and edit and preview and automatically upload them um, as iOS apps, Android apps, progressive web apps that we call Imagineer web apps, so IWAs. Um, we collect uh, automatically um, the data from the tours, uh, both uh, proactively and passively. So proactive is when we ask questionnaire sort of um, uh, data and passive is when we just know where you've been and what you've listened to. We upload that automatically to, um, to the cloud and we analyze that and, and share that analysis with our clients. So that's um, what we do. Uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble here with this. Um, we have a team that covers the sort of bases you might expect. Um, we do the flat and 360 videography. We do all the video sort of working. We do a lot of recording, translating, transliterating. Um, uh, we prioritize our own in-house graphic design and obviously we do our own mobile and web uh, development as well. Um, so um, to give you an idea of scale, uh, this is our headquarters. Uh, Stephen, we were just talking about this. This is um, Fulham Palace. Uh, this is our home uh, for the moment at least. Um, it has been, we know, an occupied site since the late Mesolithic period. That means about 6,000 BC. We know that it changed hands in 704 AD as a substantial property from Bishop Turtle to Bishop Wald here. Um, the property stretched from Chiswick to Chelsea and up to Willesden Junction. So uh, over 1,300 years ago, um, a fact we like to remind our um, American cousins. So more about that later. Um, we also have a very different office in Amsterdam, which is glass and steel. I founded the business with a colleague in 2009, and we're now joined by uh, 35 permanent members of staff and 100 what we call contributors or a network of freelancers to whom we provide meaningful continuous employment. And they will be writers and studio people and translators and occasional heavy duty videographers and other sort of odd things in different places. Um, In-house, we keep sales and customer service, we keep design, we keep tech design, tech delivery and project management. We have a JV in Poland. Uh, we have several people who already in March, uh, so by in, sort of beginning of the year, we're working from home in Norfolk, in Barcelona, in Slough, in Salisbury. As a digital company at our heart, we can take um, advantage of the fact that people can be anywhere. Um, we have um, worked, uh, we have 200 sort of active clients, as it says there, we worked on, worked on over 500 projects. We've built about 40,000 of these multimedia devices, and with them, we've served about 40 million visitors in the 10 this years that we've been going. 
in 20 languages. I'm proud of the fact that we do about half our business as export and at least at the beginning of the year, and we haven't looked at the numbers since, and we've got 95% client and staff retention. So these are all good things. And now the obligatory client slide, which I'm going to... Um, None of the usual things are working there, so we'll just go like that. Um, football clients on the right. Uh, the great thing about last night's game is that both Brentford and Fulham are building stadiums at the moment, so hopefully um, they will require multimedia assistance. A couple of big scalp clients on the cultural side on the left. Um, uh, and obviously, we, this is a small selection of a much larger number. And then how did the pre-war years look? Well, the answer is pretty damn good. Uh, we had steady accelerating growth uh, from 2015 um, onwards. Um, we had our usual issues like capacity issues, uh, but prices were rising, the wheels were turning, backs were being sort of happily patted. We had worries. Uh, one of the worries that I have had for a couple of years is that we single sourced a great deal in China and that we have reckless Americans in charge of the world, which is making it much more difficult. Um, we now single source much less in China, but the devices are still single source, and that is a concern. We had a big plan last year to crack the US. We spent six months working on that, and that has so far come to nothing. And we were looking at what I call, call sort of contiguous acquisitions. So um, not competitors, but people in contiguous market space, perhaps sort of virtual reality type uh, companies, something of that sort. But what I did not anticipate was that it would be a big worry that we got two thirds of our revenues from visitors. Uh, and the way that works is uh, different ways, but broadly speaking, if you go to a visitor attraction and you rent a device, which is ours, with content on it, which is ours, then we will get paid for that. So it's on a sort of per visitor at an attraction type basis. So um, we all know what happened. We were tooling along quite happily uh, with our 43% growth rate in 2019, and we tooled straight into the wall. Um, we were 10% ahead of our budget in Q1, even though in mid-March visitor revenues fell suddenly to zero. By April, revenues were down 88% in Q1, in Q2, um, our quarters being the calendar quarter. So April, May, June, as Stephen said, the revenues were still down for, by 75% as we were locked down. Um, what do you do? You turn, first of all, to this guy, Jared Kintz. If you haven't come across him, I highly recommend him. Very, uh, um, he said, at first sign of crisis, the ignorant don't panic because they don't know what's going on. And then later on, they panic because they don't know what's going on. So um, we had a, um, oh, there's another quote I really like, which is uh, this one you will have come across. Plans are useless, but planning is essential. Thank you, Eisenhower. We were very fortunate um, building in China. Um, we have a manufacturer in China who goes by the wonderful name of Dragon Sheng. And he was living our experience three months ahead of us. He wrote to us and said, the coronavirus is very, very cunning and fierce. This was an email directly uh, from Dragon. His English is good, but a little bit idiosyncratic. The incubation period is 14 to 28 days at the time that we were being told, by the way, that it was five days. Many people do not know he has got the virus and has no any, any problem, but he can still infect others within 10 seconds. So the mask is very, very important to protect yourself. That's as it is, but this next one was interesting. Many young, strong people died because of the virus. Until now, it has no 100% effective drugs to kill the virus. So that was a, that was a piece of luck, um, even in the form of a dragon, and we were no longer ignorant. Uh, we could therefore officially afford to freak out completely. Um, what do you do? You call a summit, and on the 10th of February, relatively early on, we called this Amsterdam summit um, with the senior team. Um, it was a good idea, it turns out, because it allows us to benefit from the wis wisdom of crowds, uh, sharing responsibilities in the decisions and, and, and setting priorities. The three priorities we established were cash, people and clients. And uh, we also built a strategy at that meeting, which we called the mother of all pivots towards healthcare and digital everything. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But first, as an ex-consultant, you know, I go nowhere without my SWOT analysis. Um, and Dragon, it turns out, was able to help us here as well from afar. What you can see there, um, apart from the fact that this is our national sport full of paying visitors or fans, the difference between visitors and fans, as you know, is that fans don't need to be rational, um, is, uh, oh, empty, <laughs> empty stadium, hang on, ah. Well, the Chinese characters there um, are Wei Ji. Wei Ji means dangerous opportunity. 
and you may have come across this, it's the Chinese word for crisis. So we were in a crisis and it's obviously dangerous, but there are opportunities and that's very much the way that we think about this, um, this period. So here's our SWOT analysis. Um, I did not generally think these were our weaknesses. It turns out they were. We used to think visitors and devices were a good thing. Um, dependence on visitors was a good thing we thought, but it turns out that was a weakness. We thought that our devices as a source of differentiation were a good thing. It turns out they are a potential viral vector. And we used to think the banks were here to help. And um, Max, it'll be interesting if you have a different view on this. Each of these has corresponding strengths, of course. Um, I have um, a fantastic, long-suffering, competent and motivated team. And as it happens, mostly very well adapted to working remotely. Um, so that was fantastic. We have a supportive investor group, don't we all? And we had another piece of strong, strong piece of luck, which was a December year end. So our financial year ends in December. And of course, what we do in December is we, we hoard as much cash as we can in order to present the best balance sheet that we can to the accountants and to, uh, and to the statutory accounts. So at the time which Dragon was saying, wake up, this is really serious, we were sitting on a great pile of cash, which was great. Um, these strengths were all at risk, and here were the dangers. So the first danger, of course, is running out of cash because there's no revenue coming in. The second danger is um, a sort of people danger, which has been an enormous amount spoken about, written about, discussed about mental health. Um, that's clearly an issue we have had to take seriously. I don't think we are at the greatest risk from a mental health point of view, but clearly motivation is an issue. And we were thinking quite hard about maintaining motivation amongst our staff. One of the issues which I worry about a little bit is the social capital, what I think about as sort of the decay or the ebbing away of social capital. <clears throat> it's perfectly clear that the working from home is not a problem for three months, but whether it is a problem for three years, I'm not so sure. Um, we've taken on one member of staff in the lockdown period, and I've never met him. I probably would not recognise him if I crossed him in the street. I know the first, uh, don't know the first thing about him, and that is a problem, I think, in the long term. Also, in the long term, there is this one-way shift away from devices. In the first um, 10 weeks of lockdown, I heard somebody say we'd had 10 years of digital evolution, and uh, that is a uh, sort of danger for us. Um, but we quickly also agreed opportunities. Um, one of the opportunities directly flowing from that um, danger to our device business was to accelerate the plans we already had, to be fair, to deliver digitally. Um, secondly, uh, to accelerate uh, our um, build up of the healthcare division. You can see it's now called a division. But importantly here, um, to uh, shift our mindset from products to services um, from hardware to software and to a SaaS model um, for Imagineer, which is a big change and, and requires a lot of thought, but is exciting and, uh, and a good one. So out of this discussion in Amsterdam, Scenario Man produced the plan, which Eisenhower predicted would be useless. And here we came up with three scenarios, mild, moderate, and severe. We don't need to go through them. This was presented in March. Um, and uh, with a range of possible outcomes, you can see our severe outcomes saw site revenues falling by 50%. Um, and uh, three discrete types of risk to the business that we identified. Um, I mean, what is the, uh, um, there's clearly a health risk, there's, um, which, which we know so much more about now. There's a risk to the business, which is on the effect on tourism and visitor attraction, but then also there's a risk of global recession. And there's just one thing I'll highlight here, which is that we identified then that there'd be many healthy as well as previous zombie businesses that Stephen mentioned that may fail through no fault really of their own. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, um, uh, with a brother in the army, I've been, I, I've been uh, exposed to this idea of the seven Ps. Uh, we, we think of eight Ps, which is prior planning, and preparation probably prevents piss poor performance and, uh, and, and the three corollary P's, which is the plans produce priorities. Um, and uh, we had now by mid-February basically got the stage set. So on to priority number one. Priority number one, um, here we are, survival. We had hit the wall or changing uh, analogies, we'd flown into the mountain, there were body parts scattered all, all, all over the place in the snow, high in the Andes, 
help might be on its way. We really didn't think so, probably not. What do you do? Um, it's worth saying just in passing that we'd blown way through our severe scenario by the end of Q2. I mean, we were just, even though I was trying to think worst case, I wasn't even close. What do you do? Well, you turn to another American president, which is Teddy Roosevelt. You do what you can with all you have where you are, i.e. don't whinge, get on with it, throw everything at it. What does that mean in our case? Well, we had a strong starting position, which was this December year end, but we implemented a travel freeze, a recruitment freeze. Um, uh, we raised the bar for our marketing expenditure. We tried and successfully in Amsterdam, renegotiated our office rents. And we slowed CapEx because demand was actually slowing and we declined most discretionary expense requests. And that hopefully is enough. If it isn't enough, then we have a sort of tier two, which is we have, as it happens, issued a loan note every two years in quarter four. Um, so there is a, everyone's expecting a loan note to be issued in 2020 in quarter four. We could bring that forward if that's the case. We might have to resort to pay cuts. We hope not. We might have to resort to a rights issue. I certainly hope not. And whisper it quietly we may need to consider redundancies, but all I'll say about that is I've been made redundant and it is pretty evil and best avoided if at all possible. And that's our intention. What about sea bills? I hear you ask. I mean, this German shepherd with the mini barrel of schnapps around its neck that comes up and rescues you. Don't worry, we were on it in a flash. So sea bills. Um, uh, Barclays has been our bankers at Imagineer since day one in 2009 and on day three of the lockdown we applied for a C-bills loan. What follows is a cautionary tale. Um, we tend to think of C-bills as standing for um, chucking Barclays into liquid shit. Um, we have a junior, in it. we had a junior inexperienced, massively stressed, no doubt, account manager who was lazy and despite being told differently misrepresented our accounts to their unseen, unaccountable credit committee. And nevertheless, eventually, they approved £100,000 in writing of late April, and they withdrew it again in May and told us how great the £50,000 bounce back loan was. We appealed, he invited us to appeal through their process and never even received an acknowledgement, let alone any, any, uh, any, re any, any resolution. We're members of the CBI, so we appealed on uh, so with the CBI um, and, uh, and through the CBI, and we never even received an acknowledgement. So I don't know if we're an outlier. I don't know if it's because we work in, in, in visitor attractions and they had given up on visitor attractions. I don't know if we'd done something terrible in a previous life. But if not, then Barclays is simply not fit for purpose and deserves to die. Nevertheless, we kept at it and we kept the main thing, the main thing, and we came across a delightful startup. Um, called Ebury, 50% owned by Santander, whose main business is foreign exchange, but who were um, registered, uh, authorized by the Bank of England to offer Seabills loans. And we have a £200,000 loan from them. Um, and we're absolutely delighted in the end. It's a better deal than Barclays. Um, and I highly recommend Ebury. As I say, their main business is foreign exchange. If you have any foreign exchange issues, go to them. That's number one, the cash sorted. Number two is staff, reassuring staff. Everyone's shit scared at this point. What do you do? Well, remember that 1300 year old office. Um, uh, first, first thing we did is we said, listen, you don't, you don't need to work a nine to five day. If you want to avoid public transport when it's busy, come in earlier, leave later, do what you want, flexible work, working. And then of course, when it turned into working from home, that was for us dead easy job done. We did take advantage of the furlough scheme, um, but with, uh, um, an important principle which I want to establish, which was that we only furlough whole teams at a time. Again, this was a piece of luck. Um, my view about furlough was that, and I'd be interested in other people's views, was that it can be um, divisive inherently, if not initially. If you're, if you're carving a team in half and saying, you guys go and sit at home and we'll pay you, or the government will pay you, and you guys have to pick up the slack and stay in the office, Despite everyone holding together at the beginning of the process, that becomes divisive eventually. Um, we did top up to 100%. We sent everybody learning on our LinkedIn learning subscriptions um, uh, to upskill them, multi-skill them, cross-train them. Um, I wanted to be clear, this was not a, performance, a judgment on their performance. Um, and that in, doing, in, in sitting at home and doing furlough, which was, of course, initially fantastic and eventually quite worrying for people, they were financing their colleagues' salaries. It was an important mission that they were on. Um, 
we of course had we policy of zero redundancies um, senior staff took a six month pay deferral which was designed to be meaningful um sort of noticeable um not too painful i would say about a four on a pain scale and you see i put it in inverted commas there because i'm not i would say there's a 50 percent chance we'll never see that money again we also upped the communication i know claire's on the call and this is very much in claire's department um, claire held an, an increased number of team meetings uh, training by Zoom of different sort of discussion items. Our quarterly staff meetings turned into monthly virtual staff meetings. Um, uh, when people were returning to work, which they now mostly have or all have, uh, we had one-on-one -on -one return to work meetings with them and were able to discuss, uh, you know, for example, if they are um, working on client sites, how do they get there if they don't have a car and they don't want to use public transport? What equipment do they need working from home on the longer term and that sort of thing. Um, I want to make a distinction there between returning to work for the furlough guys and working from home. So everyone is still working from home, but everyone is now, is now sort of working uh, pretty much. We also did an attitude survey of staff, which was in May, and uh, we asked them how it was working at home. And everybody, 100%, said uh, uh, with reservations or completely, it was a good experience. And when we said, how much would you ideally work, want to work from home? 75% said at least three weeks a month. That was interesting. Um, that goes to the point about the office, Stephen. We, we have this wonderful office. Uh, we're not anticipating filling it anytime soon. Um, if there are other people who want to use it, let's have that conversation. Um, I did worry a little bit about um, the social capital, um, the accumulated uh, experience that we all have working together might ebb away. That was one thing. Um, just another point I'd make there about the board meetings. We used to have quarterly board meetings and we have since the beginning of lockdown had weekly board meetings. So that is another sort of increase in communication. That's what we did with staff. So then on, on to number three, clients. So we did a ton of things with clients. I'll just do, a, I'll just say a couple of things about that. Um, one of them is how we thought about clients change. So we thought about uh, previously football clients and museum clients and NHS as a client and other client types. And now we've started rethinking about legacy clients, that is clients we used to have, where there is an ongoing revenue stream, which they can't get out of, rather like our office rent. Legacy new business, which is new business from our legacy clients, which they clearly took a decision to, um, to commission during the lockdown, therefore we can be sure is real and longer term. And what we've called pivot clients, which is this um, pivot towards digital everything and the um, healthcare business. Um, just as one example, we've worked um, successfully with the Ashmolean for a while now, and what we were uh, set out to do with them is to entice groups who think that the museum is not for them, so the children and, and family party, family groups, um, and we've been able to help them fast track their digital plans in new ways. Um, an example of that is a game or gamifying uh, the museum experience. In this case, it's a, it's a picture where we make your own composition in, in, uh, in perspective there by dragging and dropping things, and, and that's just a sort of fun thing to do. Um, there is um, an opportunity which I have tried to keep the team focused on to increase carefully our share of voice. We are determined to be one of the ones who are still standing at the end, but there will be others, our competitors, who I suspect will not be standing. We need to make sure people know about us and know about what we're doing. And that's why carefully we've increased social um, and press release and some other discussions uh, online. And then as uh, obviously from a client point of view, there's been a huge midterm threat to our device business. We needed to address this very urgently. And what we did about that was built a COVID-19 support pack, which I won't go through, but you can see here very early on, this is in by early, early March, I'm guessing, we had um, a whole series of uh, mitigations that we had sourced through our contact dragon, our friend dragon in China. Um, so that was our three, and we, we sent that out to our clients, you know, and, and we said, look, we're here to help, and here are some ways where the, how you can safely reopen when we get there with our devices. And that was important. Um, uh, most of it, it's fair to say, has not been picked up by our clients. They don't, most clients do not use most of these initiatives, but that's not really the point. This is about us being proactive and saying we're here to help and we'll do a thinking on your behalf. And as um, Edison, the, the inventor said, you know, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that things will not, that it will not work. And I rather like that quote as well. Um, I could spend, I could spend a, an entire seminar on why it is that devices have been until now a preferred solution for visitor attractions when we all expect it to go BYOD or to the mobile phone. Um, the change may be happening now. 
and uh, and that sort of leads on to our pivot strategy which is uh, having thought about our first three priorities where we turned our attention next the first then part of this is what i called digital everything um crises definitely force change and um uh Early on, I came to the view that the change that this crisis would, would force would be to digitize everything. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. This is one we built onto our devices in the software already on the device, something that we call safe space, uh, which allows the devices, as you see in the graphic there, to, uh, to buzz and to alert you if you're within a, a certain distance of other people. So that was a safe space tool that we built. And I, I like that idea because it turned what was inherently a potential problem as a viral vector into part of the solution. The second thing that we did was we built what we call Tool Builder Plus. I mentioned a moment ago, it's our CMS or content management system at the DMS, which is a device management system all rolled up in one. It allows you to build, it allows us, our, our partner, uh, partners and our clients to build, to preview, to comment, to share, to edit, um, uh, um, the experiences that we're eventually deploying in some way and then to upload them onto the devices on site onto uh, um, um, iOS and Android apps on the on the app stores and onto our Imagineer web apps and then on the Imagineer web apps themselves or what we call the IWA Imagineer progressive web apps the IWAs here we can offer exactly the same experience this is um, uh, Sao Paulo in in Barcelona we're offering four languages and um, that's how you charge the, uh, you load the tour onto, onto your phone. It's a very similar experience to what you see if you were going around the site with devices. You can take it off the um, uh, site, of course, um, uh, at home as well. So, and there's a sort of pinch and zoom map and you tap the little, little lozenge and you go through to that piece of content. So uh, it's relatively straightforward, relatively easy um, for us to turn a, a device tour into an imaginary web app tour. Um, it's the same experience, rich multimedia, multilingual, as you can see. Uh, it's been on the agenda for years and brought to the front of the queue by, uh, by, the, um, by the COVID crisis. So that's that. Um, that was priority number one. Priority number two, you remember um, um, when granny leaves an outrageous amount of money to the poor cousin and suddenly she's belle of the ball. Well, step into the limelight, imagine your health. Imagine your health. We've been, um, uh, oh, by the way, this is... <laughs> The quote from Dostoevsky, times of crisis uh, of disruption and constructive change are not only predictable but desirable, they mean growth, um, if you don't starve to death in the revolution, that is. Thank you, Dostoevsky. Uh, we've been working for the NHS since the beginning of Imagineer. I tried to kill it off as a, as a, as a distraction about four or five years ago and failed, thank goodness. Um, we build apps for the uh, NHS. They're pretty excellent. Um, one of our apps here is a um, uh, sort of mum and baby app. Uh, which is billed uh, by Orca, who, who qualify um, uh, healthcare apps in the top 1%, so better than 99% of all other NHS or other health apps. Um, and we have a different model there. We license the app. So we build it once. It's a nice, nice model. Um, and, and then we sell chunky license fees multiple times. That's championed by Claire, who's on the call. And uh, we have eight NHS trusts signed up to the mum and baby app so far. So that's great. Um, we built a website and that was a purely a lockdown uh, sort of uh, uh, um, initiative. Um, this is Imagineer Health. Um, we've been meaning to do this for a, a couple of years now and we eventually got around to it. There's our mom and baby app I mentioned. Um, this is about governance. You know, NHS, working with the NHS is different and it's difficult and thank goodness for that. It's also expensive. It means there are barriers to entry and there's more money inside. And finally, last initiative was just getting around to stuff. Um, and I'll mention a couple here. Um, I put here manuals and spec sheets because we build things and we need to we need to uh, we need to build the manuals and the spec sheets. It's not it's a bit of a bugbear of mine. It's not here because it's of central importance. It's here to remind me that I had the mother of all meltdowns about this issue about now a month ago, um, and was then surprised and so, somewhat surprised and very grateful that the team didn't quit on mass at this. Uh, at this sort of uh, um, meltdown. So that was the reason for that. More importantly, we did this brand refresh. Um, we advise other people on branding. So on the basis that Dr. Heal, myself, um, Claire set about uh, with the team understanding the branding. Um, we asked, uh, how would you describe the company? And that was some of the answers. And what do we do really well? And that was some of the answers. And there's a lot to think about there. Um, sources of value include being friendly, you'll see, which is why I'm so against redundancy. Um, uh, include being 
a growth company? Well, what happens if we're not a growth company? Uh, include hardware and hardware design. What happens when we deprioritize or where that is effectively deprioritized? There's a lot of change here, which we need to be aware of. And then there's the brand itself. And the brand, that's the old brand you see here. Um, uh, essentially, it boiled down to let's grow up, let's harden the edges, let's lose this radar thing, which you can see in the middle, the green radar sort of sign. And that's what turns into our new brands, quite similar, um, but just a slight evolution of that. And that's it really, that's all really I was going to say. I have two last thoughts for you. The first is lessons we're learning. Um, in terms of leadership, I think it helps to be collaborative, um, consistent, clear, and as far as possible to care for your staff, and obviously not to lose your shit over manuals. Um, in terms of the business, um, I think what we're learning is that wholesale change can be good, Change requires focus and a great deal of perseverance and thinking of that Seabills loan fiasco. Um, uh, we are constantly scanning the horizon for opportunities. We're determined to be the one who is standing at the end and there will be casualties we can take advantage of and a constant need for vigilance to get there, which is always about replanning and reforecasting and the reason we have our, month, our weekly board meeting rather than three monthly. And I would say on that, we're definitely not out of the woods. And lastly, in terms of the economy, um, Visitors travel when they feel wealthy and safe. Confidence is everything. And of course, it's traveling visitors who visit visit, visit attractions principally. Um, the return to scale will be precarious and it will be slow. I love this quote from Alexandre Le Drou Rollin, who said, there go the people, I must follow them for I am their leader. Um, he is a 19th century French politician and intellectual. It goes without saying and very much my type of leader. Um, and uh, in terms of the economy, I would say, you know, this, um, every, every self-important presentation needs a, a, church, a Churchill quote. Um, this one is from 1942, which, by the way, is therefore in the middle of the war. He said, this is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. That's exactly where I feel we are with this virus. Just on that, the reasons that we don't sleep well yet, I think we're going to have, and that is possibly not true for everybody, but for our business, a very, very tough winter ahead. We're not supposed to be having a second wave in the summer when we're outdoors. We were told that the second wave would come in the winter when we were indoors and breathing on each other. But it's happening now, and I don't think that's good news at all. And it's also true that you don't need to lock the whole country down to have a national loss of confidence. I, su I suspect that is a sort of um, uh, um, a big worry. Um, I am a huge fan, serious fan, of Andre Hoffman, who is the Hoffman of Hoffman La Roche. He, um, he's a philanthropist. He's a great thinker about the way business works. And um, uh, he says, that, and I agree with him, there's no solution to this crisis without a properly functioning vaccine. That is where I think we are. Um, we need to get this pivoting phoenix out of the fire as fast as possible. And I think we will need more luck. We've had a lot of luck. I think we will need to continue uh, to, uh, to need luck, uh, skill, patience, and faith. And therefore, uh, every confidence, we will, we will get there. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I will, Steve, hand back to you. I guess I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's really very interesting insights there. Um, a number of actions that I know a number of you have already taken to your businesses and a few new ones. Um, but it just shows you the extent of where visitor attractions are in general in the travel business. Last night I had dinner with the chief executive of a cruise liner and she, oh. you know, she was talking about the fact that the cruise industry she didn't think would return to Q1 of next year. Um, and I think that is incredibly optimistic. Um, right, well, we're going to do a bit of a, a shuffle around today. So Annabelle is going to um, lead next. And um, Max, um, I, I want to come back to you because I want to do um, a, a longer session with you, if that's okay, and I'm, I'm concerned we're going to run out of time. So, Annabelle, I mean, to support some of the points that Andrew has just been making, no doubt you've got some evidence that uh, business is thinking the same way. Mute. Okay. I'm muted. Um, yeah, thanks, Andrew. That was absolutely gripping. And uh, whilst the time was ticking, I think, God, he's going way over. But every slide was a winner. So thank you. And uh, I think every, my conclusion from that is everyone needs a dragon in China um, because that really absolutely got you onto that track of planning in advance, which is what a lot of our very positive leaders have come back and said. That's what's really helped them. So we did, we've done two bits of research, um, pulse checks. We went out to the C-suite uh, in early July 
I went out to around 1,094 C-suite leaders in the UK, 50% large business, 50% SMEs, to ask just two very simple questions. Uh, what were their stress levels? And what did they see the main challenges were? Just to try and get a snapshot so that you as leaders can um, get a sense of, of what the, the pulse is really. And unsurprisingly, 56% uh, said they were extremely or very stressed. Um, and I think there's an interesting thing here around C-suite admitting that vulnerability to their teams. And Andrew, you talked about care and consideration and I'd add in kindness to that. But to really acknowledge that we're all in this together. Yes, we might be in different sized houses with more people around the kitchen table than others. But for C-suite not to be remote from their teams and to really admit that they are feeling it, but we've got a plan, so planning is key. So some of the comments that came along with that were, this is the greatest time of uncertainty I've seen in 21 years of trading um, in event management, feeling like it was unlikely, their business was unlikely to survive, um, feeling very isolated as a CEO, lots of CEO comments around feeling that they were really alone in this. Um, that's on the, the negative side. Those that were feeling more positive, so we had 24% saying not very stressed or not at all. And some of the things they started to say, which uh, that's why I want to lead us on the basis, this is a, a positive uh, session today, is that whilst they had lots of fears, they really started to look at what, what could they do to change, to adapt, to pivot, um, to use that P word, and to really focus on what it is they offered that they could re-engineer, repurpose um, to serve their clients and a real focus on um, what clients needed right now and to get a real client understanding of their clients and customer base. So the main challenge is that uh, they dropped down into several sections, 61% fear recession, the big R word, um, and 22% fear in the second wave lockdown, whether that's local or national, is, is the big fear because as you quite rightly pointed out, Andrew, that knocks confidence like nothing else. And um, one in 10 talking about Brexit, that's still bubbling away in the background. Um, and I think Boris's announcement around obesity have been a bit of a trying to get us off their thoughts around Brexit, but that is all happening um, with much less media attention than perhaps it, sh it should be getting. And then 4% um, really challenge around debts and financial and cash flow, and then 4% suggesting other challenges. So to sum up those, I think there's a lot of frustration around government guidelines at the moment and the lack of clarity. Um, the ongoing fear of public transport and travel in general, so airports being the, the big vector and, and mixing ground for the virus, so knock-on effect for um, international travel and, and business. Uh, again, the second wave in London, the economy being knocked, um, knocked back with the smaller businesses around um, the city in particular. Um, managing staff and the cultural decay, uh, again, Andrew, you, you've picked up on that, and managing staff remotely and keeping that motivation going um, beyond the three months, if this does turn into two, three years, um, how do you create that, um, that spark amongst your team? Um, so it, generally the, the view is amongst C-suite that this is a very long road to confidence returning, um, but those who have shown a, a mental fitness, who have seen that there is pain there, um, but have turned their attention to planning and, and um, scenario planning for the future, do have some really positive things to say. So we thought we would just go out to a wider audience. So this was leadership in general, so beyond the C-suite to so senior directors. So we went up to two and a half thousand leaders in the UK. Um, and some really nice things coming through. We asked for their opportunity. What did they see the opportunities were in all of this um, mess? Um, and so I just thought I'd list a few here and do feel free to pull out and tweet any of these or add them to your list perhaps if you haven't got them already on your your radar um, so some of the obvious ones are providing virtual access to the services you offer or products uh, and um, again Andrew's given some great examples of how they're doing that building new income streams transferring um, or transforming the future of the work for your current team so creating an exciting future for them um, creating ways of meeting up that perhaps you haven't thought of before and similarly with clients I know some clients are now doing walks in the park with client meetings because you can't meet them in meeting rooms but you can still have distance contact so being lateral and, and imaginative around that um, growing into new markets um, we personally at q and we started working with a COVID testing team uh, very topical uh, and it could actually be a milestone client for us because we're going to be testing um, over 100,000 or, or asking for feedback on over 100,000 tests a month so looking at the opportunities within the um, the crisis 
um, driving growth through new offers, new offers entirely. So getting your team grassroots level up to brainstorm and think, what is it you could be doing? What skills have you got internally? There was a great, great case study by, I think it was XYZ um, recently that was on the Pimento group, worth looking back at how they pivoted their business around their invisible offer that they weren't sharing with their clients and how they turned that into a revenue builder. Um, and some clients who aren't currently trading globally, if you're moving your products and services online, you've got a whole world ahead of you instead of it do, doing face-to-face -face business locally. So think globally now with your online offer. Um, so some of the takeaways I've asked you to think about, particularly around mental fitness, I'm really passionate about this because I haven't got a quote in pink writing with the who to attribute it to, but my view is that there, there is pain, but suffering isn't a requirement. So pain is inevitable, suffering is not. And whilst you can have your panic and your meltdown and see sweet, have obviously all gone through this. If you have three things in mind and ask you to take these three takeaways, um, and some of you are probably already on this journey, or if not, just a way to um, refocus, is to really connect and collaborate with contacts. So reshaping what it is that you do and telling that story out to your clients and to your team. What is it that you've done during the pandemic to sharpen up? And I think Andrew again you used a great phrase around um, lo uh, losing the soft edges. So tightening up your offer so that it really suits what your customers and clients need. And adapting and expanding and diversifying your products and services so they really talk to what your customers need right now and underpinning all of that <coughs> is to really gauge and, and take the pulse in our words um, of your client and your audiences now to really make sure that you're offering and supporting them something that they really need so key message is to stay nimble it's it's not one plan is going to last you for the next three months it's literally week by week i would say as we have government guidelines changing, your client needs are changing, their budgets are being released or frozen. So staying nimble around that and reinventing your business for success. And that was the clear message that was coming through from some of the least stressed and most positive leaders that we were pulse checking. And um, for any of you that would like to see the full results of that, very happy to share that after the talk. Um, I didn't want to put slides and charts up for you, but I was trying to give you a, a general uh, overview. So. In summary, yes, half of leaders are bloody stressed, but those that are the most positive have taken on the kind of actions that Aunt Andrew so beautifully uh, shared today, which is constant planning, asking the team what they need, really checking with clients and adapting accordingly. That's it for me in a nutshell. I thought that was great. And love the way it dovetails, obviously, what Andrew has been talking about. And um, a few questions coming in from people at the moment. Um, well, one question um, for you, Andrew, um, and that is, you know, you spoke about obviously the fact you have a series of different measures and activities that you anticipate you may need to take as you move um, into the winter months. Um, clearly at the moment, um, you know, with government advice changing on a weekly basis, it's, it's virtually impossible, isn't it, to kind of plan, as Annabelle was suggesting, you know, more than a few days at a time. Um, but I do know um, ticketing agencies, um, well-known company, Albemarle, been in the, in the theatre ticketing business forever, I think over 100 years, uh, having to close their doors. Um, hotels in London, you know, uh, um, concierge is being laid off, um, and never, you know, the Golden Keys, all those sort of people who, you know, have been an important part in the fabric of um, visitor attractions in London disappearing. What, two things, really, two questions. One, um, what are you seeing from attractions in terms of how they are changing and, and how they are trying to represent themselves and survive through this period? And secondly, the ancillary services that supports the industry, what have you seen that they're doing differently or are talking about doing? That's for you, Andrew. Let me just um, unmute you. There you are. Oh, oh I keep doing it. Sorry. Do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um... In terms of the attractions, I mean, there's a, there's a small difference between um, the museum type attractions and the stadium type attraction. I think stadiums are slightly more ambitious, uh, the museums are slightly more cautious, and there's a difference between what we see in the, on the continent and what we see here. And I think that's about our, our, our response to how we've dealt with the crisis so far and the degree to which the British are, it appears, more, more concerned and more nervous. Um, if you take the Van Gogh Museum, for example, it opened quite early on. 
Um, it opened with a much reduced capacity, which it is slowly raising. Um, and uh, revenues are returning to the Van Gogh Museum, our, our revenues are returning to the Van Gogh Museum, but they're at about a tenth what they would have been at this time of year before, something like that. Um, the stadiums, uh, um, uh, one of the comments that we've, we've, we've heard is that they're running tours which are more outdoors than indoors, uh, which is obviously a good idea because the risk of transmission of the virus is much reduced outdoors. Um, and in terms of ancillary service, I'm not sure I can best answer that actually. I don't know whether Claire, you have any thoughts about ancillary services? I don't think I do. Um, just, just no, to add that. Hi, Stephen. Sorry, I've just taken myself off mute. <laughs> That's right. Um, just to add to that, I think with the, the stadiums, because of the scale of the environment we're able to work with, we can reroute, we can navigate, we can manage tools in a very different way. And increasingly, most of our stadiums have opened using devices and are using things like our safe space solution, but also our group guiding solution to keep family groups together and individuals separated. So there's some technicality to it. There's some change in the content offer as well. Um, and we very much see ourselves as a bridge between the fans and the club as much as the attraction. So we're able to reposition content that can be digested before you visit, follow up that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a kind of blended approach of very much being beyond the device in the person's hand. It's reusing that content, re-articulating it, changing that experience and helping them get numbers through the door. I think museums, particularly in the UK, are more of a challenge. Um, and I think they've had more press attention of the audio guide is dead, which I read in the Times, which was factually inaccurate because they picked three museums that didn't actually have audio guides in the first place so they were dead in that instance but those kind of environments I think are slightly more challenging you've got people stopping in front of objects gathering around something um, but certainly our attractions are working with us to, to get up and running and get people using devices as quickly as possible. Yeah I, mean, I know the sector is um, slow to respond certainly traditionally the museums are and you would thought actually this would actually accelerate their digitization programs and start yeah. to actually think about giving access to audiences on a global basis rather than just expecting people to come in through the turnstiles it, yeah. it will and one thing we have to get over is still in museums you'll see in this country there's a big sign with a red uh line through a phone do not use your phone in the gallery so getting them actually over that <laughs> that issue in the first place, which has been 20 years in the making, that's moving faster. Um, and using content to navigate and keep people separate is actually something that we're having a lot of conversations about. Great. Well, thank you to both our speakers today and, and, and thank you for attending. And um, one other thing to say, you were talking about new ideas. Annabelle earlier on about actually how you engage with people and, and, and one idea that Andy has um, brought to the fore is the concept of pimento networking. So for those who are based in the southwest, there's a couple of um, dates I think later in this month where um, bubbles of six as I understand it, one being led by Andy, one being led by David Morley are going to be doing a four hour trek from Bath um, to a pub no doubt and then back again from the pub. Um, but it, we've been talking and thinking over the last few weeks how we can get the 6pm clubs back up again and Isabel's working on a plan. I strongly suspect um, that at a regional level it's something we're going to be able to do, but I think there's a lot of resistance still to people coming into London. But I'll be interested in your views. Um, we know we can have a maximum number of 30 people. We've got venues we can socially distance at, but it does make uh, networking quite difficult. Um, I just added an extra mile, David, to your walk. I thought it was. A, 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 don't, I think it's four miles each way, David, not not. To, not uh, <laughs> not five miles each way, but yeah. So yeah, let us know about the six pm clubs. Whether you would be a supporter of getting back um, into an environment. Clearly, obviously, as we move into the winter months, it's not going to be possible to do them outside um, unless you have lots of layers on. Um, but we are keen to try and press the flesh as soon as we can. And um, in the meantime, networking seems to be a good way to go. So uh, good luck with that one, and, and thank you once again, everybody. Next week um, we'll. Be looking at a couple of really interesting topics. I'll be publishing um, the information shortly about what we're doing next week. I'm then going to take a two week break and then back again in, in September. September. Uh, and we've got plans really to go right the way through to the middle of October. But obviously, as things change and as your feedback, we will reflect on that and get the relevant people in front of you. So, any ideas are good ideas. So, do, do keep them coming. Thank you very much and have, have a very, very good day. Thank you, Stephen. Keep smiling. Thanks, Stephen. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.